Welcome back, folks, to another episode here, another PowerCast, uh, this one focusing on the uh, second half of the Cold War. Uh, in the first half of the Cold War, uh, we focused more on U.S. foreign policy and some of the uh, uh, things going on internationally and uh, U.S. policies regarding that. Here we focus more on the United States itself and what's going on in the U.S. during this Cold War, ducking and covering, uh, building bomb shelters, being worried about the bomb, uh, but also uh, making lots of money and living lavishly, uh, while others not so much, uh, a world of segregation um, and unequal rights. So we have this kind of uh, duality going on uh, in the United States during the Cold War. Um, and on top of that, you know, it's important to point out, even though we've bro broken this into two parts, really, U.S. Uh, foreign policy uh, very much relies upon U.S. domestic policy because remember the U.S. has to address its issues with segregation, um, with racism in order to win the hearts and minds of all of these places that are uh, decolonizing after World War II. So let's uh, tune into the 1950s here. Uh, we start by looking at a picture of uh, downtown New York. That's Times Square there right around 1954, 1955. Some nice cars out there. So what we'll look at, um, you know, we're, we're going to look at this uh, affluent society, um, but also um, the not so affluent society, uh, the major divisions, um, and all of this uh, culminating in uh, presidential election of 1960. We don't delve into that too much here, um, but you know we are laying the foundation um, for that in the kind of next turn into the 1960s following this. And some of the topics that will come up here, Richard Nixon, we'll be talking about him here really soon, uh, Nikita Khrushchev and uh, the Soviet Union, of course, um, and some other aspects of, uh, of the United States uh, in this Cold War. Well, here we have a family um, who has a little bit of food in front of them there, um, and behind them. Uh, this is a portrait of... Um, of uh, Steve Zelensky. Uh, he's an employee with uh, DuPont um, and he's posing with his family and the food they consumed in the year 1951, so just a single year of consumption uh, of these four folk. Uh, the family, I know as I said four, not poor, uh, the family spent $1,300, which today would be about eleven grand, um, $11,000 on food, uh, and that included 699 bottles of milk, 578 pounds of meat, and 131 dozen eggs. Uh, nowhere else in the world in 1951 was food, though, so available and so inexpensive. Welcome to America in the 1950s. So the reality is this, because of uh, wartime production uh, in the Marshall Plan, the United States has tons and tons of prosperity, right? In the 1950s, uh, the United States has the most robust economy on the planet. And let's face it, they're providing, the U.S. economy is providing for much of the rest of the globe, um, or, or a good chunk of it, I guess, um, especially, say, Western Europe, um, and also uh, Japan, uh, some other Asian countries, um, you know, providing um, uh, food, um, supplies, uh, even eventually, you know, weapons and things like this. Uh, so all those things are being made in the United States because U.S. industries get up and running during World War II and don't shut off um, until, of course, things start to be, uh, industries start to be farmed out and labor farmed out as we move into the later 60s and into the 70s and then especially by the 1980s. Nonetheless, this prosperity in the 50s is um, way, way, way higher than what we had in the 20s. We talked about the Roaring Twenties um, in some previous power casts, um, but the 1950s, you know, well beyond that. I mean, gross national product increased 250% uh, in the 15 years 1945 to 1960. Uh, unemployment was 5% or lower. Uh, if you wanted a job in the 1950s in the United States, uh, you were going to have one. Um, and inflation, you know, about 3% or less a year. Um, but overall, too, you know, this was very much the era of mass consumption, people just buying stuff. Uh, private consumption expenditures uh, were about two-thirds of American uh, gross national product. 
and uh, the federal government also kicking in, you know, a good chunk of change, uh, spending money on infrastructure. For example, our highway system, uh, as we know it today, is going to be uh, started during the 1950s. Uh, the construction of schools, uh, especially uh, for math and science, uh, after Sputnik, we got to get ahead of the Russians. We got to get ahead. Uh, and then, of course, the GI Bill. Um, the GI Bill was put together uh, for veterans coming back from World War II so that they could uh, have government funding for their education. Um, and, you know, between 1949 and 73, uh, the median family income doubled. The United States easily had the world's highest standard of living without question. And you just look at the, the chart here and, um, you know, it looks like my uh, stock portfolio. <laughs> I wish, but nonetheless, uh, you can see, um, you know, the line graph, everything just going through the stratosphere here um, as, you know, uh, gross, uh, gross national product uh, more than doubled. Um, you know, in every way, you know, for Americans, diet, housing, income, education, recreation, uh, most Americans live better uh, than their parents had and certainly than their grandparents had. And here are some of the iconic images uh, that you may conjure up from the 1950s. Um, of course, I didn't live through the 50s. Uh, maybe many of you did not either. But if you were to uh, speak with someone who uh, did live through the 50s, uh, they could definitely tell you uh, all about each of these things uh, or ask a historian. Um, you know, uh, you see up there in the top left, the family gathering around um, the, the television, right? Um, the the moving picture box um, becomes all the rage uh, by the 50s and 60s uh, and some of the uh, most uh, hokey um, sitcoms that you can imagine coming out at this time, like Leave it to Beaver or The Honeymooners, these types of things. Um, the president uh, during much of this, uh, for much of the 1950s, uh, Dwight David Eisenhower, there in the top middle, uh, I remember Ike as he was called. Uh, was a um, general during World War II, uh, the top U.S. general, the top general uh, for the European theater. Uh, he was the mastermind, of course, behind D-Day, Operation Overlord, uh, June 6, 1944. Uh, and he's president uh, through much of the 1950s, um, playing a lot of golf, having a couple heart attacks, and um, initiating a lot of coups. Um, uh, other cultural things, um, uh, you look over to the far right, you see uh, the Kang. Elvis, Elvis Presley, of course, with those gyrating hips. Um, everybody was sure, well, not everybody, uh, the older generations were sure that um, Elvis was presenting us with um, Satan's brew of music, this this rock and roll, the bane of our existence. Um, I mean, you know, they did have a point because, you know, swing music's pretty good. You really didn't want to see that stuff from the 30s and 40s go away completely. <laughs> but nonetheless, the kids go crazy um, over Elvis. Um, Everybody goes crazy, too, uh, over the lady there in the bottom middle, uh, Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe, very famous uh, actress, um, entertainer, um, just um, all the rage of, of the 1950s uh, and into the, well, 1950s. Um, and then over on the far left, you see a um, interesting uh, bomb shelter. Um, you had companies that would build bomb shelters for American families um, for a good chunk of change. Uh, you could have one of these uh, tubes basically put into your backyard. And most of these companies said that, you know, after a nuclear explosion, you could hang out down there for about five days. I think radiation goes away after five days, right? Um, you look down there at the bottom left and here you see, um, you know, parking lots of some type of retail store here. Um, where basically, you know, this pointing out that Americans are consumers, right? Tons of stuff to be bought and tons of people to buy it with lots of money. Everybody recognized the picture in the top left, right? Uh, there's your, your old uh, Mickey D's. I love the sign. Uh, we have sold over 1 million. Yeah, next time you drive past a McDonald's, see what the sign says now. Um, the top middle there, uh, Levittown. Um, a guy named... William Levitt uh, is going to come up with this idea for these cookie cutter neighborhoods, um, suburbia, uh, as people uh, move out from the cities, and we'll talk about that later too, white flight. Um, but these cookie cutter homes, uh, these homes that just look so much alike, um, house after house, um, but nonetheless, he'll make a fortune and uh, Americans will be moving to these places. Uh, you see a really uh, nice caddy up there in the top right. Um, 
moving down from the right, um, you see Leave It to Beaver, one of the uh, more famous uh, sitcoms um, of the time. Uh, and then, of course, down on the bottom right, children ducking and covering um, out of the uh, fear of the uh, nuclear bomb going off. Um, baseball was huge uh, in the 1950s. Willie Mays, um, Ernie Banks, uh, and of course, Mickey Mantle, um, the, the Commerce Comet uh, for the New York Yankees. Mickey Mantle, um, considered one of the greatest uh, baseball players of all time. Uh, and the picture just above him, good old Chuck Berry, Johnny Be Good. Um, some great music coming out of the 50s, and man, Chuck Berry, that dude could play. And then uh, going over there to the left, uh, you see your typical uh, 1950s uh, kitchen, um, where the expectation was um, the housewife was going to, that was going to be her area uh, to work as women are, you know, unfortunately relegated to the home. Uh, we're going to see this cult of domesticity really take off in the 1950s. So it was time to show off um, between the U.S. and the USSR. Um, uh, the Soviet Union uh, in um, June of 59 had held its own exhibit uh, in New York City, basically showcasing its uh, machinery, its scientific advances, um, you know, basically things to show you that communism was working and um, that the Soviet Union was this modern, you know, remarkable uh, place, right? Well, the U.S. not to be upended, uh, they put on their expo uh, a month later in Moscow, and this is led by the vice president um, under um, Dwight David Eisenhower, none other than Richard Nixon. And out of this, uh, we get the great kitchen debate, as we'll talk about here in the next slide. But, um, you know, Nixon, you know, when he went into this, uh, what he was supposed to show um, was that, you know, America, that they're idealists. Right, that, that Americans were not all about materialism. We're actually idealists. We're thinkers. Uh, we're, we're people who live by ideals, not by material wealth or material things. So Nixon went on to address the crowd with a speech titled, What Freedom Means to Us. Um, and it was not, Nixon said, uh, freedom of expression or differing forms of government, but the extraordinarily high standard of living uh, 56 million cars, 50 million television sets. Um, that um, made the United States this great prosperous place. So um, yes, the idealists uh, coming up with ideas of other stuff that you want to buy, <laughs> basically. Um, and in the United States, there's, you know, there's no question that consumer goods become this kind of symbol of freedom. And here you see what comes to be called the great kitchen debate. Uh, you see Nixon there with Nikita Khrushchev um, and um, basically, you know, Nixon uh, trying to point out, uh, well, the United States, you know, uh, where we have uh, freedom and I don't know, does that sound like Nixon? Yeah, I think it does. But nonetheless, uh, there's this big debate between the U.S. Uh, and the USSR uh, about who is more advanced um, is going to go on uh, for a long time throughout the Cold War anyway. We also have something called uh, soft power. So um, in international relations, we have hard power and soft power. Hard power meaning like war, blowing things up. But soft power meaning the power of influence, using ideas to influence uh, or uh, more often products. And American products um, are going all over the place uh, at this point. And people want American products, uh, whether they be cars or television sets or whatever. Um, and in the 1950s, we see all these new innovations um, that really transform American lives, right? Uh, we're going to see um, uh, travel by jet, um, uh, customer travel. Um, yeah, we're going to see television, which will become paramount to the 1950s. Uh, air conditioning coming out in the 1950s. Um, automatic dishwashers. Uh, you can call long distance now. Still got those rotary phones, though. Um, and, you know, some other services in your home, like electricity, central heating and air, um, indoor plumbing. Hey, you don't have to use the outhouse anymore. Um, you know, and, and all of these things, you know, those were big changes for the older people still alive who had none of those things, right? So 
you know, you have to look at the 1950s and how big of a change this is um, for those who were not accustomed to these types of things. But now that Americans have all of these luxuries, right? And as a matter of fact, you know, they, they come to not necessarily be luxuries over the course of time. They come to be necessities. They, they were just features of common life, right? I mean, you, you buy a house today, the expectation is that there's going to be air conditioning, right? Still today, not all houses have central air, of course, but um, we have these general expectations uh, today. But at one time, of course, you know, that just simply wasn't the case. And really by the 1950s, um, we're seeing uh, the rise of the white collar uh, worker outnumbering blue collar uh, factory and manual laborers uh, in the United States. Um, and we do see, um, you know, the success of unions um, that, um, you know, able to increase wages, um, but, you know, employers also mechanizing uh, more of industry um, and, um, you know, a lot of manufacturing, the cost of it, you know, decreases because of this mechanization. So that makes things more affordable uh, and uh, more available uh, for Americans. And, you know, since the 1950s, obviously, the American economy has very much shifted away from manufacturing, right? I mean, you look at the American economy today, um, you know, not a lot of people have factory jobs. I mean, sure, they're still here, absolutely. Uh, but increasingly, you know, it's, it's more of service industry type jobs uh, that Americans hold. And there it is, suburbia. Uh, suburbia really becomes um, a, a thing in the 1950s. Uh, and you can see right here, Levittown, New York, and you see the houses, just the same house, same house, same house. I, I mean, you know, you, you don't want to come home at night. Uh, you will go to the wrong house. Um, eventually, you know, people could um, make some uh, changes to their homes uh, uh, if they ordered one of these. Uh, but it's just amazing how everything just looks the same. I don't see any picket fences yet. And one of the cities that really booms uh, by the late 40s and into uh, the 50s is uh, Los Angeles, uh, Los Angeles, California. Uh, and you can see here, you know, the, the suburban sprawl, as it comes to be called. Now, of course, today we have still suburbs, of course. But we also have the exurbs, right? Um, but after World War II, we see this suburban growth uh, just, just grow exponentially. And, and uh, California, Los Angeles, is one of these places that is the epitome of this uh, suburban growth. And, you know, the economy itself is, is changing. Now we do see agricultural production uh, go back up. You know, it's going to go up 50%. Uh, why? Well, because there's going to be a lot more people. Uh, we're going to have a baby boom. Um, and the center of American farming, you know, shifts to uh, Texas, Arizona, California. Um, and like I said, you know, California, they're, they're the heart of this, this boom in suburbia. Um, I mean, a fifth of the 1950s population growth occurred in California, right? Um, and by 1963, uh, California is going to finally surpass New York and be the most populous uh, state. Um, and, you know, with these suburbs, we're going to get some new things like shopping malls and shopping centers, right? Uh, people don't want to have to go into the city to buy stuff. So I guess the, um, the shops are going to come to them. Here you just see an awesome awesome picture. Uh, this is Albuquerque, uh, Albuquerque, um, New Mexico, and just a beautiful picture. And this is 1969 photograph, but you know, it's kind of the same idea of what it would have looked like in the 50s too, um, especially the, the Kentucky Fried Chicken sign there on the right. Um, but nonetheless, you know, what we start to see um, is, you know, cities spreading out too uh, into so-called strips. And we, we see, you know, strips of motels, gas stations, uh, business franchises, um, while, you know, the older downtown is kind of starting to fall apart. Um, and we'll, we will actually return to that idea of the downtown falling apart. Um, but the other big thing that Americans are experiencing, too, is the world of television. And in the 1950s, uh, TV um, just becomes all the rage. I mean, it's just like this automatic reaction. Um, <clears throat> you, you turn on the television and just sit there and start watching. Uh, and people, of course, want to keep watching television even through dinner. So you get TV dinners. And there you see uh, one of the first TV dinners there from Swanson. <clears throat> 
uh, looks pretty tasty. Um, microwaves come out around this time too, um, though I, I'm not sure that I would put that foil tray in the microwave, but uh, nonetheless, um, television too, you have to consider, is one of the most effective advertising mediums ever, right? I, I mean, people are going to sit there enamored with their you know jaws gaped open watching some show, um, and they're not going to turn it off even when a commercial comes on. <laughs> so basically the commercials then work to help sell more goods. Um, and then on top of that too, you know, uh, everybody had to have a TV, you know, all families, that was kind of the expectation by the fifties. And then of course a car, you know, the idea was that you're supposed to have a car as well. Um, and some of the shows that you would have seen in the fifties, um, weren't very controversial. Um, you know, the, the honeymooners, um, that one um, really captured the essence of the 1950s um, relationship, uh, male-female relationship in the home, sadly. Um, but, you know, it wasn't overly controversial, I guess, to an extent. Um, Leave it to Beaver, definitely not. Um, and then, you know, other types of shows you would see, just quiz shows, westerns, um, but, but nothing that um, challenged the status quo in America, nothing that really challenged, you know, race relations, segregation, um, how women are treated, how natives are treated. There's no, there's no questioning of that quite yet, um, at least on television. And there you see those brand new fancy TVs rolling down the line. And you can just check out with the, um, the uh, graph here, um, the, the increase in television viewing um, on a daily basis. And, you know, like I said, I mean, this is the most effective advertising medium that you could imagine, right? Um, people are constantly watching television, as you can see here. And corporations, you know, they they would um, sponsor popular uh, television programs. You had the General Electric Theater hosted uh, for quite a while by Ronald Reagan, who will later become president uh, in 1980. Um, and, you know, a lot of these TV ads, of course, are, are made for the middle class, people in suburbia. Um, and basically, you know, they just convey these images of, oh, everything's fine, everything's great. Um, you can just buy whatever you want, have whatever you want, uh, endless consumption, the good life, and so on. And um, with the automotive industry, you know, cars really become aligned with freedom. Uh, one commentator wrote in 1959, the concept of freedom has become as familiar to us as an old hat or a new Ford, <laughs> because cars now really become uh, essential uh, to Americans. Um, but it also makes sense because as people are moving further away from the city, well, you still might have you know jobs closer to the cities or work closer to the city, um, and you know you don't have a lot of um, public transportation service out to suburbia, at least not at this time, and even today. And even when you do, it takes quite some time for the transit system. So, you know, people start to see cars as more essential and it also becomes kind of a symbol um, of wealth, right? And if it's, you know, attached to freedom, then people feel that they have to have it to, well, be free. Um, you know, so by 1960, you know, we, eight out of 10 families had at least one car, you know, um, about 14% had two or more cars. And that's the other thing, too, about these cars. I mean, they were supposed to go out of style, right? Now, back then, they actually made cars out of this thing called metal. Um, <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, that metal uh, was shaped and formed into a particular style for that year, right? So, you know, if you keep driving that car after two, three years, it's kind of like, oh, wait a second, there's a new one, and it doesn't look like mine, so I need to update my car, even though it works perfectly fine. And I mean, think about it. 1950s cars, I mean, and 60s cars, you still even today see some of these, of course, you know, the classics, but, you know, these were, these were cars that were made to last uh, in terms of their structure. Uh, they just weren't made to last in terms of their style. Um, and basically, you know, we're going to see uh, General Motors, Chevrolet, uh, Ford, um, you know, they're really going to become the, the wealthiest corporations in the United States. And here you see um, an advertisement for a, a 1959 Cadillac um, in El Dorado. I am sure that thing got great gas mileage, a good five or six miles to the gallon. I'm kidding, I don't know, but um, 
Well, oh, oh, there you go. I forgot that I wrote down. Uh, a lot of them got less than 15. I'm thinking he probably got less than 10, I would guess. But nonetheless, um, you know, it didn't matter because fuel was pretty cheap uh, back then as well, right? Uh, you look over to the right and you see um, an advertisement, a commercial being set up um, uh, to film um, uh, a car advertisement. Uh, in the background there, you know, it kind of pictures this idea of driving on the open road, right? It's, that's freedom. So the American government had been discussing this idea of an interstate highway system um, since at least the 19 teens. Um, and um, as a matter of fact, there was a um, kind of an expedition, if you will, uh, in 1919, the, the Motor uh, Transport uh, Corps Convoy. And uh, one of the people, um, one of the, by the army, so one of the soldiers who was along uh, for this um, uh, trip, this convoy, uh, which was going to go from Washington, D.C. to Oakland, California, you know, um, a few thousand miles there, um, was a young lieutenant colonel, Dwight Eisenhower. And Eisenhower, uh, on this trip, you know, reflecting back, uh, he saw just how long it took them and how many obstacles there were um, getting from the East Coast to the West Coast. Um, and, you know, this was more than just a, an expeditionary, you know, travel. They also repaired a lot of bridges and roads. And of course, you know, they took breaks and things like that. Um, but essentially, you know, it, they found that it's not easy to travel all the way across the United States. And of course, it's not easy today, even with the highway system. Uh, but back then, you know, with the lack of a highway system, you know, Eisenhower understood the necessity. And then, of course, um, with World War II and the occupation of Germany, um, he also you know, was there in Germany uh, to see the Audubon. Now, of course, the Audubon of course, uh, had been constructed um, as a Nazi public works uh, program. Um, it was part of their larger program uh, infrastructure. Um, and Eisenhower liked the idea of this you know, large open roadway that goes across a country um, uh, to be able to move, move people. Now, of course, the bigger issue, uh, once we get around to the Cold War, um, in 1956, when they set up, uh, the Congress passes the interstate highway system to fund it. Um, the other big issue too, of course, is the midst of the Cold War. And what Eisenhower is thinking here is that, okay, what if we get nuked by the Russians? <laughs> it's always on their minds. Um, well, we need to be able to evacuate major cities, right? Um, so the idea is that you have these highways and then, of course, um, uh, subsidiary roads going around cities uh, as well. And whenever you're out driving on the highway, a major highway, um, you, you'll notice uh, if you look, you'll see a small sign. It's usually, I think, a blue sign uh, as you're getting onto the highway, onto the entrance ramp, and it'll say Eisenhower Interstate Highway System. Um, and the idea, too, was that um, should the Soviets, you know, launch on America, you know, the first thing they're going to take out are our military installations, right? Um, including, say, airports and aircraft and so on. Um, so the idea, too, is that these highways would have these long, straight stretches um, where they just go straight for a long amount of time because that's a runway in an emergency uh, during a nuclear attack. Um, but anyway, this highway system, you'll notice uh, the odd numbers go north and south and the even numbers go east and west. Um, we start with uh, Interstate 5 all the way out in California, and we end with Interstate 95 all the way out going through Virginia and up the east coast. Um, and then you have know, same kind of idea uh, going um, horizontally um, <clears throat> east to west. Um, well, I guess yeah, east to west uh, traveling, uh, but looking at the map going north to south um, with the uh, even numbers. Uh, but nonetheless, um, this highway system, it's actually not officially finished until 1993 um, out in Colorado, uh, a section of I-70, I believe, still needed to be completed. Um, but nonetheless, this interstate highway system, uh, something that we take for granted today, uh, but that is you know, fundamental to us. And the status of women. So uh, shifting gears now, looking at um, kind of the, the disparity in America during the Cold War. So for women who were in the workplace following World War II, remember in World War II, um, as the men went over to fight, women filled up the, the, the factories uh, to produce for the war, um, Rosie the Riveter and so on. 
and you know, make no mistake about it, if those women don't fill the factories um, during um, World War II, uh, the United States is not successful in that conflict. Women played a huge role and proved, you know, obviously that they can do any kind of job a man can do. The problem is once men returned, so did the um, paternalistic expectations on women as well. And women were kind of relegated back to the home, especially middle class uh, and, and higher uh, social status uh, women. Um, women who did work, you know, the, the pay was low, um, you know, especially even if they did similar work to a man, it was still lower. Uh, they were typically in clerical sales and, and kind of service labor. Um, but during the 1950s, you know, Americans on average started marrying younger and had more kids uh, compared to previous generations. And that's why we call this era, the, the 1950s, the baby boom, and hence the uh, name uh, for that generation, the baby boomers, uh, because of the, the huge uh, amounts of births, as you can see on the graph here, uh, that occur uh, shortly after uh, World War II. So people born into the late 40s and into the 50s, um, even into the 60s, uh, this baby boomer generation. Uh, but the expectation, of course, you know, returning to our topic here with women was that, you know, they were supposed to stay at home and, and raise the kids and, and be a good little housewife and, you know, in their Levitt house in the middle of suburbia. And this is kind of the sad reality. First of all, the image that you see over there on the left is a maternity ward, right from 1946. And you, know, you can see just all the babies there. Um, but a bizarre image to your right there um, that really captures the, the essence of life uh, for women in the 1950s, uh, especially middle class. Um, this idea that um, golf, which of course was associated with uh, what men did, you know, on the weekend when they didn't have to go to work all day. Um, but hey, women have an activity that's life, like golf, vacuuming and cleaning. See, it's fun. Um, I mean, this is the type of things, you know, that you would see in the 1950s that, you know, somehow women would enjoy this role as being a homemaker and not being able to really have any other, you know, ambitions, uh, should they have them. Um, and, you know, being a homemaker is hard. It's, it's hard work. Um, but it can also be monotonous. And what ends up happening in the 1950s is, you know, women become kind of constrained and confined to the home. Um, and it's like men kind of get to go achieve their dreams, but women not so much. Um, and basically that's what this ad for this vacuum cleaner is doing. It's equating housework uh, with the game of golf. And the reality for women though, you see there on the right, um, you know, life for a suburban woman, um, wasn't quite as um, idyllic as, you know, advertisers uh, were trying to say, right? Uh, here you see a mother, um, you know, perhaps a, a single mother, perhaps, you know, uh, you still had separations, divorces, this type of thing too. Uh, but nonetheless, even if she did have a husband uh, living in that house, the expectation was she took care of the kids and made dinner, right? Uh, and you see, you know, what's going on there in that image. Um, but, you know, that's the thing. I, I mean, feminism kind of disappears briefly. Uh, remember feminism, that term uh, really came into being at the start of the 20th century um, during the progressive era, but it seems to kind of disappear. And as a matter of fact, you start to see um, a lot of psychologists and psychiatrists um, and um, so-called mental health professionals saying that, well, the, you know, this idea of feminism uh, in, in women having these ideas of, of equality and rights, it's kind of a mental disorder. You know, um, <laughs> unbelievable. Uh, but, you know, that's kind of the reality um, of this time and, and how, you know, people started thinking. Um, prominent psychologists insisted that the unhappiness of individual women or, or even a desire to work for wages uh, stemmed from a failure to accept the maternal instinct, right? Uh, women are supposed to think like, you know, wanting to have a wage and, and go to work and these types of things. No, they're supposed to have the maternal instinct. They're supposed to stay at home and raise children, right? So, so if you hear, you know, doctors and, and so-called professionals saying this at the time, it really becomes um, imbued and, and a part of the social order. And, you know, a 1947 book, Modern Woman, The Lost Sex, and basically it said, the independent woman is a contradiction in terms.
So not only were things difficult um, for females uh, in the 1950s, uh, African Americans as well. Uh, we still have, at least at the start of the 1950s, a segregated landscape. Uh, now, of course, we're going to see a, a breakthrough Supreme Court case during this time, Brown versus Board of Education. Um, but nonetheless, the, the realities of segregation are very real throughout the 50s, 60s, and even into the, the 70s. Um, but African Americans, you know, they really couldn't get um, public or even private financing uh, for housing. Um, and really, you know, the suburbs, um, basically, they kind of cut off residents from uh, the, the urban areas, the city, the downtown city. So basically, as white folk uh, move out of the downtown city, uh, African Americans are kind of left stuck in that city, but they're not given access to jobs and work. They're not given access to, to get loans, to, to purchase their own homes. So we see poverty. Uh, begin to really grow within these inner cities and the suburbs themselves. I mean, there's these just extreme racial boundaries, uh, as we'll see here uh, in the next couple of slides. Um, but I mean, you know, even as late as the 1990s, nearly 90% of suburban whites lived in communities with non-white populations of less than 1%. Um, and this is really a legacy of government decisions, real estate developers, uh, banks, and the residents themselves. So this, you know, segregated landscape, I, I mean, you have federal agencies that uh, insure mortgages um, that make sure that, you know, if houses are resold, that they're not sold to non-whites. Um, uh, you know, these, the Levitt communities, William Levitt's uh, houses, um, a lot of them refused to allow uh, blacks to, to purchase uh, homes there. Uh, even if they were army veterans, uh, they, they couldn't rent or purchase homes. And William Levitt explained his reasoning. He said, quote, if we sell one house to a Negro family, then 90 or 95% of our white customers will not buy into the community. So, I mean, <laughs> It's terrible. It speaks to the, the economics. It speaks to the, the culture. It speaks to the society um, and the situation that African-Americans found themselves in uh, in the 1950s and, and obviously well before this. And here you see the reality. Um, here's a sign that you would have seen. Here's a, a development here. Um, suburban home builders uh, would openly advertise, you know, that, that minorities were not welcome. Uh, this is a, in Southern California, 1948. Um, and you can see it says this tract is exclusive and restricted. Um, in other words, African Americans uh, not able to uh, purchase a home there. Um, and, you know, Congress had actually passed a, a Housing Act in 1949, which authorized the construction of uh, about 800,000 units of public housing uh, to try to provide a, quote, decent home for every American family. But the thing is, is that the law set this really low ceiling on the income of residents. So it was a rule demanded by these private contractors who wanted to avoid competition from, you know, the government uh, in building these houses for the middle class. Uh, so housing projects were, you know, limited to the, the very poor, uh, but, you know, white neighborhoods were successful in opposing the construction of public housing and kind of confined segregated neighborhoods to the inner city, right, which reinforced this concentration of poverty um, in the urban non-white neighborhoods. And this aerial view captures it um, remarkably. Um, here we see um, a low income housing project in Brooklyn, and we see how the public housing has concentrated uh, poor Americans um, in these structures separated um, from the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, so what we see with this suburbanization of America is also this hardening of the racial divide in the country as well. Okay, so let's talk uh, some politics. Not that what we haven't been talking about, of course, is our politics. I guess maybe more Washington, D.C. type politics and specifically the president, Dwight Eisenhower. Eisenhower was elected in 52 uh, because he was kind of seen as... as Papa, Papa Bear, right? Uh, he just kind of looks like this, this kind of dad. Uh, he was also considered a war hero. Uh, he was. Um, so, you know, it was just kind of this natural... Um, evolution for him to become president. Um, but the thing is, I mean, he also kind of captured um, 
this um, this uh, separation of wealth and poverty uh, of the 1950s by who he appointed to his cabinet. Uh, a lot of wealthy businessmen, uh, basically. But he did this too because a lot of these wealthy businessmen they know how to run an efficient business, right? Um, but just you know, as an example, um, his Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, you know, he had been a, a partner with a banking and loan company. Um, his Secretary of Treasury um, was a steel company president. Uh, his Secretary of Defense uh, was General Motors CEO. Um, uh, and then other secretaries later on, banking, um, even presidents of, of furniture companies. So, you know, these are the types of people that he was bringing in, you know, to his cabinet, um, which, you know, have, have positives and negatives. Um, nonetheless, too, uh, in terms of foreign policy, uh, U.S.-Soviet relations, eh, they, they do improve a little bit, especially when the Korean War comes to an end. Uh, another reason why Eisenhower gained so much traction was because he kind of helped uh, bring it into the Korean War. He, um, well, Got an armistice anyway. Technically, the Korean War is still going, um, but you know, with the end of the Korean War and the death of Stalin, uh, relations thawed a little bit between the U.S. and the USSR. But the problem is that the Eisenhower administration still had the policy of massive retaliation, which basically meant that uh, they told the Soviet Union that, hey, if we think that you're going to launch on us, or if you do, we're launching everything we have, <laughs> right? which is dangerous. That's, they actually start calling this brinkmanship because the idea here is that if you're telling them that you're going to launch everything you have, then that's code to them that if they want to win a nuclear war, the first thing they have to do is launch everything they have. So <laughs> this is actually called nuclear brinkmanship. Uh, the other aspect uh, in terms of foreign policy with the Eisenhower administration was a huge use of the Central Intelligence Agency. During this time, the CIA was able to operate outside the U.S. and, believe it or not, inside the U.S., not until the late 70s, uh, the Church Commission um, uh, a uh, congressional uh, act is passed to, to ban the CIA from operating in the U.S., um, but that's not the case until the 70s. So nonetheless, um, but returning to foreign policy, the CIA is used to overthrow numerous, numerous um, leaders, um, especially in places like Iran. Um, the Shah is going to be installed in Iran by the CIA. Um, actually, Kermit Roosevelt, a nephew of Theodore Roosevelt, is going to lead that coup. Uh, and the Shah of Iran, Pahlavi, uh, is going to be the U.S. guy. But he also uses his secret police and, and brutal methods and tactics for um, you know, punishing his people, keeping his people in order. And this is the thing, is that people in Iran, they knew that the Shah was backed by the United States. Right. So basically everything, every negative action that the Shah took toward his people was not only blamed on the Shah by the Iranian people, but also upon the United States. Eisenhower also uh, is able to help commence this um, using television uh, for campaign ads. Uh, you shorten Eisenhower to Ike and um, check out down there. Um, the, the very famous uh, Eisenhower campaign ad that you would have seen on television ad nauseum during the 1950s uh, and 52 campaign. I like Ike, you like Ike, everybody likes Ike for president. Um, and you can watch that on uh, the YouTube channel there. Um, but um, Eisenhower very much uh, electable uh, at this time. You can see him right in here in the uh, convertible. Well, during this... Um, <clears throat> 52 uh, campaign when Eisenhower is running, he chooses Richard Nixon as his running mate. Nixon had made a name for himself in Congress um, going after uh, so-called communists in the United States. Um, but the problem for Richard Nixon, he's from California, is he runs into some issues with uh, money he may have been receiving. Um, and uh, when he runs into this this problem, it becomes a political controversy um, that basically, you know, these... Um, uh, these reports coming out that wealthy Californians had created this private fund for, for Nixon. Um, you know, Eisenhower was ready to drop him off the ticket. Eisenhower was like, I, I'm not even going to deal with this. You know, I'll just get somebody else to run with. Uh, so Nixon actually ends up um, getting some time on live national television um, one evening in a 30 minute address. Um, he gives one of his more famous speeches, especially famous um, prior to before he becomes president, uh, which he will in uh, 68. Um, but nonetheless, he gives the very famous Checkers speech, um, which is <clears throat> rather comical uh, if you want to tune in to watch that. <clears throat> 
you can do that on the next slide. But the checker speech will save Nixon's political career, uh, where essentially he um, is able to say, oh, I didn't accept any money from anybody, but I did accept this dog, and the dog is checkers. And, you know, he points out how his daughters have fallen in love with the dog, and he refuses to give it back and pulls at the heartstrings of all Americans. Um, <laughs> but the point being is that, you know, this speech – uh, points out how you know TV transforms politics, right? That you can create an image um, and then take it directly into Americans' living rooms um, and manipulate their opinions. And there is good old Nixon, uh, and you can actually watch the um, the clip there. Okay, so uh, the Eisenhower administration, as we pointed out earlier, um, they do have the, the biggest public works program uh, ever in the interstate highway system, 41,000 miles. <clears throat> um, you know, and like we pointed out earlier, this this was part of, you know, uh, for exit routes for nuclear war, but also, you know, landing spaces, things like that. Um, but in terms of international relations, too, with the USSR, in 1957, there's a huge um, scare because the Soviet Union launches Sputnik. And Sputnik was the first uh, human-made satellite to go into space. Um, and the um, essentially what this shows is, you know, the Soviets have this expanded technology and there's this big fear that, you know, the U.S. was falling behind the Soviets. And, you know, moreover, it shows ICBM capability, right, that they can actually get um, an object into space. So if you can get, you know, a basketball sized object in, into space like Sputnik, uh, you could potentially get nuclear warheads into space and then drop them down on your uh, your target. So, you know, this is a big fear. So the administration then, Eisenhower administration, sponsors the National Defense Education Act. Um, and this is the first time where the federal government is saying, okay, we're going to give direct funding to higher education. And you see this funny cartoon over here on the left. Uh, do you call a C minus catching up with Russia? Um, and there on the right, you can see Sputnik. That's uh, what it looked like. Um, you know, traveled a good amount of distance uh, before it eventually uh, fell back into the atmosphere and burn up. And, um, you know, this was part of the issue, you know, Eisenhower's administration and the Soviet Union, uh, his secretary of state, uh, Dulles, had this idea of massive retaliation. We pointed out earlier how, you know, that's a little bit problematic. Um, but, you know, in 1952, um, a few years before Sputnik, um, the United States had actually detonated its first hydrogen bomb. So the hydrogen bomb um, is even bigger than those used on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Hydrogen bomb, um, well, first of all, uses hydrogen, um, but it's actually a fusion bomb as opposed to fission. So fusion um, would be like the power of the sun. So uh, hydrogen bombs are no joke. Uh, the next year, the Soviets also detonate their first one as well. Um, and basically, you know, both sides have long range bombers so that they can um, go around the globe um, at any time. And then eventually they have, you know, um, land based ICBMs, <clears throat> missiles and, and um, eventually uh, sea based with nuclear submarines and things like that as well. Um, but interestingly, too, you know, while Eisenhower's president, um, the size of the armed services actually um, uh, fell in half. Um, that being said, you know, the new amount of nuclear warheads uh, went through the stratosphere. Uh, by 1960, no pun intended, by 1960, uh, the United States had at least 18,000 nuclear warheads. But, you know, Eisenhower's administration was criticized for the, the so-called brinkmanship, right? Dulles' uh, massive retaliation policy um, could have you know, caused a, a nuclear war. Uh, it's going to be later on <clears throat> under uh, the Kennedy administration, who will be the next president, uh, that will actually get mad, uh, the mutually assured destruction, uh, where basically, you know, both sides are kind of more philosophically rationalizing here that, look, we can't launch on each other because we're both assured of destroying each other, right? Um, but nonetheless, you know, Eisenhower's stance before this um, of the, the whole brinkmanship, you know, 
cause just this intense fear that there's going to be a nuclear war, a nuclear attack. So you have Americans, you know, being encouraged to build, build bomb shelters in their backyards and these school drills telling kids to duck and cover under their desks in case of a, um, an atomic attack, you know, basically telling the population that, eh, you know, if you get hit by, you know, a nuclear war, it's still survivable. Uh, here's an example of a uh, nuclear bomb. It's actually a British bomb. Um, and over there on the right, you see uh, fissile material. That's the amount of um, element uh, that would be used, like plutonium, for example, um, or uranium. That's the amount that would be used in a single bomb. And of course, the Defense Department uh, puts out the famous Bert the Turtle um, uh, show. Uh, so that you know, kids could watch this and and know that uh, all you have to do is duck and cover, uh, and you'll be fine. And you can check out Bert the Turtle there uh, on YouTube. So here's an example of one of these um, <clears throat> fallout shelters, uh, these these underground bunkers. Um, this family here in Michigan uh, building one, and basically what these companies would say, and really they people were building these until the early '80s. Um, what companies would say is that you know you can last about five days uh, down there in that bunker. Uh, here's another example of um, just some of the coups that were launched. Um, by the Eisenhower administration uh, to overthrow leaders in various countries. Um, the CIA uh, under Eisenhower did this quite a few times, uh, including uh, overthrowing uh, Mossadegh in uh, Iran and installing the Shah. And here's just a list of at least the known coups and suspected coups um, carried out by the CIA um, throughout the course of the Cold War and even beyond. And, you know, something else uh, that becomes very important is we actually see the origins of Vietnam and the Vietnam War uh, with Eisenhower. Some historians even stretch it back to, to Truman <clears throat> getting involved, uh, you know, as part of um, containment. But nonetheless, uh, definitely more direct involvement in the 1950s. Uh, Vietnam was divided um, at a peace conference in Geneva in 1954 um, between a communist north and a democratic south, or at least a non-communist <laughs> non south. Um, well, the United States supported uh, Ngo Dinh Diem. Uh, he becomes the U.S. guy. The problem is a lot of these guys that the U.S. props up in various places, whether it be in Central America, the Middle East, or in this case, Southeast Asia, <clears throat> or Africa for that matter, um, a lot of these guys weren't exactly friendly guys, and these not so friendly guys, you know, the people in these countries would associate with the United States. So you're actually not quite winning over hearts and minds. Um, but, you know, Eisenhower, just like uh, the administration before his under Truman, you know, they're trying to prevent Vietnam from becoming a communist nation. It's all part of this whole idea of containment. And there's a guy who um, uh, is very familiar to the United States, uh, Ho Chi Minh. Um, Ho Chi Minh becomes very popular <clears throat> in Vietnam, spreading his communist ideas, especially obviously in the north, um, which then leads uh, Diem down in the south uh, to, to not hold elections, you know, uh, <laughs> which he thought would unify the country. Uh, but, you know, they're basically afraid that communists are going to turn out and spread communism into the South as well. So what does America do? Well, what they always do, dump money on it, right? They start pouring tons of aid into South Vietnam, uh, increasingly more and more, uh, quote, military advisors, unquote, from the United States uh, start coming into Southern Vietnam uh, to support DM. Now, of course, <clears throat> DM is not going to stay on you know great terms um, with the United States. As a matter of fact, uh, he will be um, assassinated um, under the orders of uh, John Kennedy when he becomes president. Um, coincidentally, Kennedy is then assassinated two weeks later. No connection. You conspiracy theorists. Okay, so uh, looking at U.S. society too. Um, there's a big fear with uh, teenagers, but there's always a fear of teenagers, isn't there? Um, but nonetheless, uh, just looking at you know some of American culture and society, um, things that come out like Catcher in the Rye, Rebel Without a, uh, Rebel Without a Cause, the movie with James Dean. Um, uh, there's a, a group of nonconformists called the Beats. 
Um, these you know, young kids, kind of like the Fonz on Happy Days, if you ever watch that show. Um, but these, some of these uh, books that come out, Playboy magazine, some of these things that come out, you know, there's a lot of dissent against them because they're not, they're seen as going against conformity. Because 1950s is considered this era of you're supposed to conform, right? You're, you're supposed to uh, say the Soviet Union is evil, the United States is great and awesome. Um, and everybody's just supposed to kind of follow suit. You know, you go to work, you come home, watch TV. The wife stays at home uh, taking care of the kids in the house. And you live like that until you die, right? Uh, but not everyone accepted that, right? Uh, so we get <clears throat> a, a lot of uh, literary works that come out, like Catcher in the Rye, uh, On the Road, um, and, uh, you know, entire cultural movements like, like the, uh, the Beatniks, for example. And Playboy magazine, you know, it, it also kind of challenged this whole idea of the, the family-centered image, right? Um, and it reaches a huge circulation uh, uh, of a million copies by the time we get to 1960. Um, but, you know, it extended this consumer culture into the more, more intimate realms of life, right? Uh, men could, you know, escape into this kind of fantasy world um, outside of the confines of the family, uh, but also speaks to, to women because women have no real escape, right? So, so these men who, you know, these middle class men <clears throat> who, who go to work, they can go play golf and hang out with their buddies, whatever, while the woman takes care of everything at home. She really doesn't have this kind of escape. And here you see a great image of conformity. Here's commuters returning uh, from work in downtown Chicago, uh, leaving the railway station. It's 1953. And you, know, you had a lot of social critics like Henry Steele Cominger, for example, uh, pointing out that Americans uh, had just become these conformists, that all these guys here, there's a bunch of suits. You know, they're, uh, they're just organization men. Um, there's no independence of, of you know, humanity, of, of individuals, of human thought in the United States. And there was a huge fear, too, in the 50s because of the Beatniks and the James Deans of the world uh, that juvenile delinquency was running amok. And uh, there's actually a Senate committee uh, that held hearings in 1954. And what they were trying to figure out was whether or not it's these comic books, these evil comic books that are causing these young people uh, to commit criminal behavior. Uh, it's the same thing that we get with video games today, right? It's kind of the same idea. Um, you had one witness uh, at one of these committee hearings who said, you know, Superman comics, you know, they aroused violent emotions uh, among, amongst the readers. Um, you know, and even Time Magazine had a cover story about, you know, teenagers on the rampage. Um, and even a Cosmo uh, article, um, you know, are you afraid of your teenager? But let me ask you this, who is not afraid of their teenager? Nonetheless, uh, some other things about American society here. Those crazy teenagers who you know refuse to conform, they're wearing leather jackets, um, they're dancing to rock and roll, um, and you you know you have this kind of um, sexuality <clears throat> notions that you know aren't supposed to be shared in the broader uh, public in the you know conformist conservative 1950s, right? So. Uh, when people like James Dean uh, come out um, you know, with, with this type of movie and he's a good young looking guy who doesn't seem to fit in with everyone else, but everybody wants to follow him, you know, they're, they're kind of seen as, you know, evil and, and uh, people fear this, right? They fear um, that, that uh, things could fall out of order, right? And then, of course, you get Elvis um, and Elvis uh, appearing on television. Um, you know, people feared that uh, he and his gyrating hips uh, were just too uh, suggestive um, when he would go on, um, when Elvis appeared on one of the uh, most famous uh, uh, late evening or evening shows, the Ed Sullivan show um, in the 1950s, um, you know, they would only show him from the waist up, right? So you couldn't see the, uh, even above the waist, yeah, so you couldn't see the gyrating hips and so on when he would come on and perform. Um, and, you know, the beats actually come from, um, the whole idea of these beatniks actually comes from Jack Kerouac's book, um, On the Road, uh, which becomes also one of these uh, famous,
most popular books. Um, he actually wrote the thing on this huge scroll of paper that he taped together. I think you can go to a museum and see it today. I don't even remember how long it is. Huge. Uh, but nonetheless, um, you know, this also speaks to escaping from uh, conformity and things like this. And here you see some of the uh, the beatniks here, uh, these rebels without a cause. Um, you can see uh, here at the coffee house on the right, the coffee house uh, in San Francisco, uh, these people who are just rejecting mainstream culture and trying to kind of create their own. So really the beatniks are kind of the foundation of what we'll see in the 60s uh, with hippies and uh, the counterculture and that whole explosion, which is even crazier. And to finish up, you know, the other reality, of course, um, is segregation. Uh, but what's going to change that? What you see here is uh, Linda Brown, um, the young girl uh, whose parents, you know, school, sued the school board in Topeka, Kansas, um, because, um, you know, she, she had to walk this long distance to, to go to a, an all-black school when the white school was closer. And the Supreme Court finally steps up to the plate here. And in 1954, this, you know, huge, huge court case, uh, one of the most important court cases in all of American history, Brown versus Board of Education, uh, which says that segregation is illegal. So they're actually overturning the old 1896 decision of Plessy versus Ferguson, which legalized segregation. Uh, so here we are, you know, 58 years later in the Supreme Court is finally overturning that ridiculousness, but that is going to come, you know, with a lot of um, resistance, um, you know, especially in the South. And, you know, people who are trying to go against this, uh, this segregationist society, Rosa Parks, very famous. Now, she had been involved um, in civil rights organizations, you know, before this, um, but she refused to give up her uh, seat uh, on a, a city bus um, in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, and she gets arrested. You can see her mugshot here. But, you know, these are people who are pointing out you know, just how silly uh, and ridiculous, you know, society has become with this segregation, you know, pointing out these unjust laws um, with this kind of civil disobedience. And of course, you know, Martin Luther King is going to become the main voice of all this. And we get into uh, uh, Martin Luther King uh, when we get into uh, 60s and the civil rights movement. But nonetheless, you know, the foundation of all of this is happening in the 50s with MLK as well. And one of the huge controversies, too, happens in, in 1957 with uh, school integration, uh, the so-called Little Rock Nine. Um, essentially, uh, down in Arkansas, <clears throat> in Little Rock um, Central High School, um, the, the governor uh, tried to block allowing uh, black students from coming to uh, this school. Um, essentially, Dwight Eisenhower had to come on live national television and say that, you know, this cannot stand. Uh, he actually sends in the 101st Airborne uh, to go down and uh, escort these girls to school uh, and boys, sorry, uh, boys too, uh, es escort these kids to go into school. Um, so that, well, so that they could get into school. Uh, but that doesn't mean that, you know, while they were in the school, they didn't face all other kinds of, of things, you know, um, racial epithets uh, being shouted at them, uh, being hit, punched, kicked, whatever, just, you know, terrible. Um, but, you know, this is the reality. This is the United States trying to overcome uh, segregation and racism. Thanks for tuning in. I know that was kind of a long one, but hey, the Cold War's good stuff. Um, thank you to uh, Give Me Liberty by Eric Foner and W.W. W. Norton and Company, uh, providing uh, notes and uh, pictures and background for all this. Um, and there are also some other great books for you uh, to check out on the 50s. See you next time.